Hi, and welcome to our third EDCOM webinar session, consisting of a 20-minute presentation, followed by a 10-minute session for your questions. You can participate in the Q&A session when you open the Q&A panel on the right-hand side, type your questions in the text box, and then click send. Pete Badamin is our speaker today. He is famous for his seminars on branding, multimedia, advertising films, idea generation, concepts and campaign building, and creative thinking of the Art Directors Club in Germany, the Creative Club Austria, and various international festivals, workshops, and seminars. Today, he will give us an insight of the digital revolution and the new rules of big bank advertising. Give a very, very brief uh, seminar on what I will also teach in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, obviously, it's a lot more uh, intense and deep and fun to listen to, so I hope you see lots of you guys in Amsterdam. And now we start. Uh, today we're going to talk about the future of you, the future of you as consumers, as marketeers, or as advertising people. And whatever you want to become, stuff will happen to you, and that will happen in the future. And if you look at the future, and if you want to see what will hit you in the future, you have to know where it all came from, what happened in the past, where did it all begin. And if we are looking at digital stuff, then we can say it all began with Web 1.0. Web 1.0 was basically all about information, and it was about entertainment. The killer app of Web 1.0 was Google. You Googled lots of stuff, and you got the information, and you could even find out when movies are showing and stuff like that. So entertainment and information was very, very big. Uh, it's all about knowing, knowing information, finding information, selecting what you want to know, and receiving that information. If you lo look at the EACA website, that's a typical Web 1.0 website. You know what you look for, you find what you look for, and you get that information. So Web 1.0 is still totally king. It's ruling the world, and we often want to know certain things. We look them up online. But Web 1.0 today is going mobile. If you look at the time spent on media between 2008 and 2011, you will notice that newspaper declined 30%. Magazines declined about 25%, radio minus 13, TV minus 2, internet plus 10, and mobile plus 50%. Mobile is ruling the world today. Everything is going mobile. That's why when we think about digital, we put mobile in the center of our thinking, and I, you should do that too, too. I really think that you should put mobile in the center of everything that you do. I personally see in this short 20-minute seminar four times of Web 1.0 mobile digital applications. Uh, the number one is daily digital. It's stuff that we do all the time. Looking at the weather is what we do all the time. Uh, I have a balcony, and uh, if I want to know if it's cold or warm, I don't step out on the balcony. I check my mobile phone. I check on the phone what the weather is uh, because that is information that I get faster on the phone or with less circumstances, although it would be very easy for me to step outside on a balcony. I think lots of people do that. So it's about news, keeping to date with current affairs, the weather and stuff like that. It's about knowledge, uh, Googling information, knowing stuff. Today we looked up, uh, my son and I, how many red blood cells are produced in the body. Uh, we Googled that and we found that 2 million red blood cells are produced per second. We did that on a mobile phone because we wanted to know the answer immediately. Then browsing, looking for consumer reviews, what do people like, is that product good, is that product, product bad, and obviously emailing. That's all daily digital stuff that's information-based. So it's all about information. So if you design stuff like that, be sure that people are using that information all the time. This is how far we already are. We talked about browsing information and that a lot of people buy stuff. Uh, with their mobile phones. Do a digital is doing stuff like banking, playing phone cards and stuff like that, but also using maps and organizing your life. And the uh, important thing about this is that if you have a mobile phone in your hand, you might be riding a bike, you might be driving in a car, so everything that is task oriented now has to be very, very simple. Uh, I give you an example. This is the button you have to push for a certain bank to save money. 
So that's the saving button, and when you push that, uh, you're automatically saved uh, a lot of money, right? Whatever uh, amount you pre-programmed. Uh, that you can actually do while riding a bike. You can do that while crossing the street. So you have to keep in mind that all this like task-oriented stuff that people do on a mobile phone are done while they do other things. And it has to be done in a very short amount of time. If you compare that to an iPad, it's called a tablet. If you compare that to what tablet use is like, tablet use is different. Because tablet use, you actually get it out of the bag. You're likely to sit down in a cafe, whereas um, the other stuff is not uh, wonderful. The next thing is disruptive digital. I'm sorry for the internet connection. Uh, see, the internet is still developing. Disruptive. Disrupting, disruptive digital is stuff like Talking Tom or Songify and things like that. And that is basically uh, watching videos or playing games and uh, things like that. So if you are bored and you want to disrupt this boredom, you can use disruptive digital. It's basically entertainment. This is, however, now moving uh, into other realms. There is uh, Gucci is uh, doing entertainment stuff and in, in other brands that is basically disruptive uh, that is used for advertising. Okay, the fourth thing is designer digital, lots of augmented reality stuff. This is an example from Gold Run in New York that's basically just a statue or an art project. Uh, on a mobile phone. There's lots of really great stuff that I will show in Amsterdam that's coming out of UCLA. And designer digital is basically just enrichment. However, it's also being used in advertising. Uh, this is what's done in Rodeo Drive uh, in Los Angeles, a very expensive shopping zone, where you can put this beautiful party dress in the phone on your uh, wife or lover or friend, uh, even though she's wearing something different. That's augmented reality. You can uh, put layers and layers of things uh, over the real existing world. You know that with restaurants, now you can do that with fashion. There's a very famous uh, example from a group in Amsterdam that actually placed their uh, collection, their new designs, only in virtual reality in the streets of Amsterdam, and people had to use their mobile phone to see those designs and to buy those designs. That was done in May 2011, and it was so successful that they sold out within weeks and redid the whole thing in Paris, and it became a huge success about a store, basically a clothing store, where you can buy designer stuff, and that clothing store only exists in a digital augmented reality world. Very, very cutting edge. Uh, that is all Web 1 stuff. Now we come to Web 2.0. Web 2.0 is about publishing, and it's about being social. Facebook, obviously, is the killer app of Web 2.0, and it's about creating, broadcasting, connecting, and sharing. And creating, broadcasting, connecting, and sharing can be done with all kinds of things. Even if I run with Nike Plus, I create the data. Uh, Dietmar is running five miles in, in Vienna. I connect with my friends. I share the information with my, my friends. So that is, even though it's a sports shoe, it's a typical Web 2.0 example about creating, connecting, sharing, and broadcasting information. But also, social digital on mobile phones is getting very, very big. Uh, I don't know if you know about Opinionated. There's many, many other apps. And you can basically simply ask your friends or a larger group if you should, for instance, buy a certain, a certain shirt that you see in a store, or if you should uh, go on a vacation in Paris or not. You just ask uh, the people you like with this tool. It's called Opinionated. So social digital is getting very, very big. It's about connecting and sharing. There's social seating, you might know. KLM now offers that you can choose the person you sit next to in a plane uh, with the matching of Facebook profiles. Rather than sitting next to a random person, you can actually sit next to a person that shares the same interests that you have be that the same music or culture or whatever, so that it's fun to talk to that person. That's social seating. Uh, Sponsifier is a very big, big example where uh, Toyota let people design, the consumers, regular people design their new NASCAR uh, car. Uh, NASCAR is like Formula One. It's a racing thing. 180,000 people joined in and designed the car that NASCAR is going to use, uh, that Toyota is going to use 
for NASCAR. Fiat went even further and they had people design the actual car. This was the Fiat Neo. It was designed by over 100,000 people in Brazil and it's regular consumers that designed this particular car. So the people used social to make products and to make products that people love because they are part of the process making that product, part of the design process. Uh, crowdsourcing is very, very big right now. Web 3.0 came next and it's about self-creating. A very good example is the championship you might know. Uh, there's a, a German soccer player, Ozil, and he had millions and millions of friends. And you can see the championship. Those millions of friends wrote him, all, wished him all well in emails and stuff like that and on Facebook. And all these wishes were put on a chip. And that chip was put into his shoe. And when he went to the uh, World Championship in South Africa, he had millions and millions of people wishing him well in his shoe. So when he scored the goals, millions and millions of people felt part of being that goal. The chip in his shoe made the people part of that. They self-created that uh, experience. There's also now snowboard information. I will talk about that in Amsterdam a lot more, where uh, people share their data that they create with a uh, with a snowboard and you can um, be part of uh, somebody else's ride. Today we are in the world of Web 4.0 and we have eyes and ears everywhere. Web 4.0 is a personal upgrade. You become a cyborg like Iron Man or whatever. You have all the information you need. It's a personal upgrade and it's absolutely individual, totally individualized information. Apps are the key uh, application of Web 4.0. The computer is about to disappear. I uh, will give examples later. All gaps are disappearing. It's absolutely individually and it's totally connected. We are absolutely connected with everything currently. The computer disappears. If you look at Siri, you just say, uh, Siri, I want this and that. And uh, you don't even notice that there's a computer in the background giving that information. The connect is the same thing. You don't have a controller in your hand. You just move your hand. The computer disappears and it shares all that information. Uh, it's basically uh, like saying to Siri, get me a beer, and, and Siri does it. You're totally lazy. The computer does everything for you. You don't even know what you have to do. You don't have to type in stuff anymore. Uh, get me a flight, whatever. Uh, all gaps get disappear. There's this thing called kick me. And uh, for instance, if you're a pregnant woman, you can wear this belt, and this belt has a little chip. And if you, your unborn baby, kicks you in the womb, it sends a tweet out to your friend, I just kicked my mom at 11.45. Uh, so um, you, you can share the information of an unborn baby. So there's no more line between being inside the womb or outside the womb. Even if you're inside the womb, you can already send tweets to your friends. Um, all these things are also now in medical t-shirts. You might know that patients wear t-shirts that monitor heart rate and blood pressure and stuff like that and send the data to the doctor. So you don't feel that there's a computer. It's just there and it's absolutely normal. They, all the gaps disappear. It's absolutely individual. If you look at a McDonald's store finder app, it tells me where I am, where the next McDonald's is, if that particular McDonald's restaurant is open or closed, how do I get there? This is absolutely individual information. It could have never been done in Web 1.0. Web 1.0 would just say McDonald's is a fast food chain. We have burgers and stuff like that. Web 4.0 tells you individually where to go and what to do. We are absolutely connected. Everything works on every device with the cloud. We all know that. And here's an example that's relatively exciting. The Adidas store in London, uh, the flagship stores in, in London don't carry all the shoes. Adidas has over 150,000 shoes, and you might not have the golden uh, soccer shoe in 46, right? But you can buy it in the store virtually. So there is an augmented, uh, there's a basically a gigantic iPad, it's called the wall, where you can look at that particular shoe in gold in your site and buy it there. And if you're in London, the shoe will be delivered within 90 minutes. And the reason is that uh, the, a machine knows exactly in what store that shoe actually exists. So it might not even exist in an Adidas store, but in another shoe store, the machine knows that and gets you that shoe 
sends a driver there like a pizza guy on a motorcycle and gets you that shoe within 90 minutes. You're totally connected through the internet to all the shoe stores in all of London. Uh, that now then moved to the outside of shopping windows. Even if you go shopping at night and the store is closed, you can pick that particular dress from statue from mannequin number one or ma mannequin number two and buy it online at the shopping window. So you're totally connected. The store doesn't have to be open. You can go to the store, buy the products at the shopping window. This basically led to a uh, increased number of fingerprints on regular city lights, like there at the Mamma Mia music, uh, Mamma Mia musical uh, billboard. And uh, people expected to be able to buy their tickets at that billboard. So the mobile phone enables every branded communication to directly lead to the intended action, most often buying a product or a service. If your communication does not do this, it's a total waste of advertising money. So people expect to be able to buy the Mamma Mia ticket at the Mamma Mia poster. In reverse, this means that every act of purchase, especially online, is branded contact in itself. If your system is easy to use, recognizes your clients, and helps your clients connect and feel good about themselves and the purchase, then they, you will win. So the thing is, you have to cater your website and your purchasing thing to the needs of the client. If I've been looking for race bikes, 50 times in a row and I come to your website and it's a bike website, you have to know that I'm interested in race bikes, not in any other bikes. That is basically catered information for me uh, on any device. If you don't do that, you're probably going to die. Right? <laughs> okay, then what is developing now is Web 5.0. Web 5.0 is totally transparent. Uh, you might know Flow, you can look at any product and the uh, and the iPhone app Flow recognizes that product. You don't have to take a photo of the barcode. You can just take a photo of the product. So you have transparent products. I worked at the university uh, uh, last year in, uh, in Salzburg, and we did a little research thing called Mio, and it was face recognition. Face recognition today works absolutely brilliantly. I give more examples later. It's used in city lights and stuff in London already. Uh, and if you have face recognition, you can find out all kinds of information of people, like uh, their Facebook profiles, uh, if, how much money they spend, where they live, and stuff like that. So people become transparent. This will happen. There's a lot of uh, legal issues, however, but it will happen. Transparency is about to happen. Web 6.0 is what everybody's developing currently. It will be just a little poem, digital dust. Uh, it means all the cars are connected. Uh, you might know that, that BMW and Mercedes is working on that. You can even drive automatically. Everything will be connected. Every product, every car, everything is connected in real time. And this will totally change the decision process. If you learned about the decision process being a funnel over time, where at first you have a very vague idea, uh, will I go to Paris or will I go to New York? And then you go, ah, let's go to Paris, okay, which hotel, blah, blah, blah. And today, all of a sudden, your brother calls and say, hey, I have a house in uh, Norway. Do you want to come? All my plans are junk, and I go to Norway. So the decision funnel is a theoretical exercise, but it's not the reality. The reality is basically decision membranes, where everything is real time. All the information is there a volcanic eruption somewhere that uh, destroys air travel. Is there whatever, uh, a friend who, who goes someplace. All this information is available in real time and you will have real time decisions. Your real time decisions will be totally superior to your prepared decisions and the uh, mass that Adobe gave last time is uh, it's 75% uh, real time is superior to 100% of past time information. So uh, the, the advantage of real time information is substantial. And the question then is only mental cost. How easy is it to come up with a, with a certain solution? What brand pops into your mind? Mental cost, for instance, is uh, you're hungry, and the lowest mental cost thing is probably a McDonald's because it immediately pops into your mind. It's basically free. It's very easy to think about McDonald's if you're hungry. And then the other thing is excess cost. How easy is it to get to a McDonald's? 
Uh, if you don't see a McDonald's, it's a little bit difficult. If you have a McFinder, it's a lot easier. So uh, my son and I were in Venice. He was hungry, mental cost. He wants to go to McDonald's. I see a pizzeria, and he takes out his iPhone and says, but look, 200 meters further is a McDonald's. So we went to the McDonald's because the mental cost was easy and access cost was easy, even if it's virtual access uh, on an iPhone. Okay? So how is the near future of you? Best buzzword number one, it's transparent. I will know everything about you. Looking at you, I will know everything about you. Buzzword number two, no line. There's no more different. person is pouring the wine. I take a photo. I know what wine it is, and I buy it now on uh, my machine. All this stuff is happening very, very quickly, and for some people it is happening too quickly. Because if you run, sometimes you have both feet off the ground, and some companies don't like having both feet off the ground. Companies do not like leaps. They like to walk. They want to be on the ground and do the next step and be safe about the next step, and this is not very, very good because development happens in leaps. This is a curve that shows, for instance, black and white TV. In, in the beginning, nobody has a black and white TV, and then everybody has a black and white TV, and then it kind of declines. Not that many people buy more black and white TVs because color TV is coming. At first, a few people have color TVs, and basically everybody has color TVs, and the black and white TV was just uh, one per family or whatever, and my grandfather had one. Color TV, everybody has one. Maybe there's even two in one household. And then comes flat screens. In the beginning, relatively expensive. Not a lot of people have it, but now it's in every airplane. You could have never put every, uh, like every uh, airplane, you could have not outfitted with black and white TVs. So that would just not work. But with flat screens, it works. So it's a development, but those things are completely different. It is not one curve. Uh, the um, development leaped. It's the same with uh, biological single cells organism, then there's, uh, I don't know, fish, and then there's mammals. That's leaping. It's completely not a linear development. We think it's linear, but it jumps curves. And companies want to stick to a curve. They want to prolong what they have. They want to stretch the existing. This is happening currently with a lot of media where they say, no, people will always read newspapers or with telephones and stuff like that. It's happening all the time. Let's go back in time to the year 1870. The world belongs to the can. Hundreds and thousands of men and women work in canneries. Everything was put in a can. Then, a couple of years later, 1930, the world belongs to ice. People delivered blocks of ice and gave it to households where they had wooden chests and they put the blocks of ice in. And in the 1950s, the world belongs to the re electric refrigerator. Uh, the electric refrigerator becomes a standard in every home. Everybody has an electric refrigerator. So how many can producers move into ice? The answer is zero. How many ice producers, block ice producers, moved into electric refrigerators? Again, the answer is zero. They all saw the development, but they only saw their technology. They saw, they loved their technology because they knew they can do cans. I have the people to do cans. I have the machines to do cans. I love cans. I have the machines and people to do ice or to do refrigeration. They saw the separation between those things, but uh, they didn't see the connectedness. And this curve sticking happens all the time. Uh, we all had Walkmans, at least uh, if you're as old as I am. Now nobody has a Walkman. Sony couldn't move into the MP3 world and become, they were the absolute market leader in Walkmans. They didn't achieve that with MP3 players. Apple did that. Uh, we all had Polaroid cameras. Uh, we all had Nokia phones. Now it's all dead. I know the time is over. This is just a glimpse. Uh, Blockbuster also died. And um, I think, uh, let me just finish this. Why does it all happen? Because the people have a why attitude. Companies want to keep things as they are. Palmolive is a very good example. It has a steady growth and everybody is happy. I need two more minutes. Users are looking for better stuff all the time. There is a guy who bought a designer kitchen. He puts a bottle of palm olive onto the kitchen top and it says it's ugly, okay? So the designer 
said, why not invent a designer detergent? And he did. He invented a designer detergent. It's called Method. It sold $75 million in 2008 and had 3,400% growth in three years. And that is the power of why not attitude. So if you're designing the future, think why not. Don't think why. And this is uh, the end of this short seminar, and I'm open for your questions. Thank you. What do you think the next revolution will be? Okay, there's a question. The next revolution, as I said, is definitely going to be that everything will be connected. The Web 6.0 will completely change our lives. Uh, we will see self-driving cars. Uh, we will see refrigerators that restock themselves. All those things that we heard about uh, many, many years ago will actually happen, and I am actually also working on certain innovations like that, where you have automatic uh, purchasing for daily goods and stuff like that. And um, the key is uh, total transparency, digital dust. Everything will be outfitted with a digital code, and that's the next revolution. So Web 6.0 will automize our boring parts of life. OK, another question. OK, no more questions. Ah, yeah, there's another question. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Can I see the presentation again somewhere or find the slides? Um, what I could do is I could make a little handout and send it to Tamara. So, uh, and, um, there, and then you can get it. You will get, if you have any chance to come to Amsterdam, that will be a one-day workshop, and it will be a lot more in-depth and a lot more exciting. Uh, how do you convince the clients to run and take the leaps instead of walk? That is relatively simple. Uh, the thing is that I show them what happens to business who don't do that. And uh, if you look at the bookstores in the U.S., they're all going down. If you look at certain magazines, they're all go going down, unless they reinvent themselves in a relatively dramatic way. And there are ways to do that. And then I do uh, workshops with them. And uh, But basically, currently, it's showing the stick. Uh, rather than showing uh, the chocolate that you get if you do something. People, especially large corporations, are really, really afraid. And you basically just have to show them this is what's happening if you don't do anything. Because uh, evolution uh, or uh, progress will happen either with or without you. That's the key insight. OK, thank you for the presentation. I would be curious to think about the target group for Web 5.0 campaigns. Uh, are they all suitable for all target groups or for all products? There's one thing that is happening right now, and that is don't think in target groups anymore. If you think in target groups, you basically limit yourself uh, in the head. And it's much better to think about what you offer. What is the advantage that you offer? Uh, it all happened with the switch from uh, uh, demographic target groups. I'm targeting people between 14 and 34 to uh, psychological target groups and targeting people that are interested in adventure because you can be interested in adventures even if you're 64 and you cannot be interested in adventures even though you're 24. So that is now moving even further and it's just that the brand uh, gives an offer to certain things. And if you look at really, really big brands, the brands lead. They don't follow the target groups, but the target groups follow the brands. The, um, Again, uh, Apple is a very good example. Uh, everybody thought uh, iPhones were totally stupid. Everybody thought the iPad is totally stupid. It is revolutionizing the world completely, and it's just because Apple didn't ask the people what they want. In the old times, you might know the very old saying about Henry Ford, who said, if I would have asked the people what they want, they would have said, faster horses. Uh, in the turn of the century. But instead, he invented the car. So lead the market, don't follow the target group. So I think that Web 5.0 will find its uh, applications to lots and lots of things. The example in London is that there's face recognition if you're a woman or a man, and if you're happy or if you're sad. And depending on the gender and depending on your emotional state, you would see different ads, uh, either chocolate ad or beer ad, for instance. 
There is one more yes. question, Dietma. Yeah. Um, Gerald is asking, in what period of time will these developments be established in the society? Okay, the thing okay. is, um, in the short um, presentation, I didn't show you the, the increase in, in speed of reaching 50 million people. You might know that. Uh, the radio took 38 years to reach 50, 50, 50 million people. TV, 13. The Internet, 4. Facebook, 3. iPod, 2. And apps, 1 month. So the, uh, the, the time it takes for society to adapt certain technology is absolutely shrinking. If you look at, I want a new phone every year. If I have a phone that's four years old, I go, oh my God, what is that? I, I, I'm completely, if somebody shows me a phone four years old, I'm completely flabbergasted. My parents had their regular stationary phone probably for 40 years. So uh, the leaps in technology are getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. So I think that once technology is introduced, like look at the apps, Already there's a, a, a billion apps, I think, was last month or something. It's getting quickly adapted uh, into society and into absolute mainstream of society. And it's now 40 minutes into the seminar. Again, I'm sorry for the little snafu with the, <laughs> with the online connection. Uh, I thank you very much for being here. I will send a handout to Tamara. Yes, I'm And I hope I see... Yeah? Isma, just to let you and all the others know, we recorded this webinar, which will be on the EDCOM website, so you can always uh, have a look at it. Oh, that, that's much easier. So yes. that's much easier. So scratch the thought about the handout, just uh, go onto the EDCOM webpage and look at this webinar over and over again. <laughs> Well then, thank you very much and thank you for participating. The next webinar will take place on, in June, on the 6th of June, and we will keep you updated who will be the next presenter. Thank you very much and have a good day, all of you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.